you're an army vet ensconced in the safety and tranquility of your suburban home, lying side by side with your loved one in your bedroom. And then suddenly you wake up perspiring, panicky. The walls recede into nothingness and you are back in the battlefield surrounded by enemies, fire, smoke and the hopelessness of a situation which ultimately must culminate in death. Your heart beats fast, your brain is scrambled, your instinct is to flee, to vanish, disappear somehow. This is a flashback. Gradually, you wake up from it. It's a kind of dream state. But while you are in the flashback, you believe that it is completely real. You experience it as absolute, unmitigated reality. And your reactions, bodily, mentally, are the same as if you were truly back there in the battle zone, faced with extinction. Then you wake up, or you don't actually wake up, you transition from the flashback state to the waking state, and Sam Vaknin is playing in the background in one of his interminably boring videos, <laughs> which in itself is another trauma. <laughs> My name is Sam Vaknin, I am the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. I am also a professor of clinical psychology, PT my students. And today we are going to discuss one of, them, one of the least understood symptoms in psychology, known as flashback. Flashbacks are a complex symptom in a variety of dissociative disorders. And this particular lecture, I deal with flashbacks in post-traumatic stress disorder, in CPTSD, complex trauma, and the second half of the video is dedicated to borderline personality disorder. I'll go, go to the description, descend <laughs> into the hell of the description. There are links to two videos which I recommend that you watch. One of them is titled How Trauma Breaks You Apart, and it's a video that deals with structural dissociation. And the second video is Triggering in Narcissism, Borderline Trauma, Addictions and Compulsions, a recent video that I've made. There are also, there's also a bibliography of two books which are the ultimate Bible about dissociation and dissociative disorders. They claim to be editions of the same work, but they're not. These are two completely separate books, bizarrely. <laughs> okay, so it is clear from the opening description of a flashback situation, it is clear that it is compulsive in nature, it is intrusive, is not voluntary, is not a memory, is not a thought, a cognition, is not even, it's not even an emotion. It's when the distinction between real reality and imagined reality, this distinction blurs between reality and fantasy, if you wish, or more precisely between reality and the memory of reality. So when there's a memory of reality, a reality that's been traumatic, a reality that's been overwhelming, a reality that's, that caused dissociation, sometimes we are thrown back to that earlier um, period in life. And then we mistake this earlier period for the later period. We kind of reincarnate back backwards. We experience the memories as if they were reality. This inability to tell reality from memorized reality, this inability is, at the, is the crux and the gist and at the heart and the core of flashbacks. Now we can induce flashbacks artificially, for example, in therapy, especially in some types of therapies known as re-traumatization or exposure therapies. And we can induce um, flashbacks 
even in hypnosis. Actually, there's a hypnotic technique known as revivification. Revivification. It's a technique in which suggestion is used in order to induce an individual to revive and relieve forgotten or inhibited memories. That's in hypnosis. But flashbacks occur spontaneously. They're not the outcome of any suggestion or any outside intervention. They just happen on their own. They take the person by total surprise. And at that point, the person is no longer with us. He is hurled back into a reality all his or her own. He is embedded there. And he acts in a waking, waking state. He or she acts as if they were in that reality, not in our common reality. So if someone has a flashback of a battlefield, they're likely to shoot you because you are the enemy. If someone has a flashback of an abusive, traumatic situation, such as rape, they are likely to react as if they are being raped. This is the essence of flashback. And that is the big difference between revivification and similar techniques in hypnosis and therapy and revividness. Vividness is the reliving or the re-experiencing of a specific situation in life as if it were real. Flashbacks of a traumatic event is the feeling as if a traumatic event from the past is happening in the present. A feeling as if you are reliving the event rather than only remembering it. And this leads me to the problematic, not to say nonsensical construct of emotional flashback. First of all, there's no such thing, period. But to explain why there's no such thing, I'm going to quote an authority on dissociation cited in the books that I've mentioned before. And I'm quoting, the importance of distinguishing between the PTSD symptoms of intrusive memories and reminders of distress on the one hand and flashbacks on the other. This is important. In other words, we should distinguish between the two. Flashbacks are not intrusive memories. They are not intrusive emotions. They are not reminders of distress. They don't remind us of anything. Flashbacks are conf states of confusion where you think you are in a reality that is actually not real. You mistake your internal space for an external space. Okay, I'm continuing, I'm continuing to quote. Uh, here we are suggesting that only with flashbacks is there a misapprehending of the past for the present. There is an alteration of consciousness of our experience of time. Comparably, distress experienced when recalling a traumatic event that happened in the past is held to be qualitatively different from relieving a trauma as if it is occurring in the here and now. In other words, you cannot have an emotional flashback. You cannot have a memory flashback. You cannot have any kind of flashback as long as you maintain your grip of reality on reality, as long as you maintain your reality testing as long as you know where you are, who you are with, what it is that you're doing, and you're just overwhelmed and flooded by emotions and memories from the past. That is emotional distress. That is emotional recall. That is not a flashback. So emotional flashback is nonsense. Next. A, uh, a sizable percentage of patients with dissociative disorders have recurrent or concurrent PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder seems to go hand in hand with dissociative disorders. The fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual even introduced a dissociative type of PTSD. This is known as PTSD-D. Now, complex PTSD is the consequence of developmental traumatization, usually, developmental. It's long, 
the abuse or the trauma are long, regular, and a salient feature of the environment of the individual. And this creates complex trauma. Now, complex CPTSD is actually a new diagnostic category in the ICD-11, but not in the DSM-5. The dissociative type of PTSD in the, in the DSM-5 limits concurrent, disso concurrent dissociation to experiences of depersonalization and derealization and coupled with overmodulation of emotions, which is a very narrow and limited view and also happens to be counterfactual, as any trauma therapist would tell you. And so the prevailing view nowadays is that flashbacks and other intrusive phenomena are also dissociative experiences. And I refer you to work by Van der Hart, Neurenhuis, Steele, and others. Okay. So we have established that flashbacks have something to do with dissociation and dissociation has something to do with a post-traumatic stress disorder, whether complex or non-complex, but especially non-complex. Flashbacks in PTSD seem to be memories experienced as if they were happening in the presence and the person conceptualizes this situation, this experience, as re-experiencing. So flashbacks are a form of re-experiencing, including the re-experiencing or reliving of symptoms. Janet, Pierre Janet, which I will discuss a bit later, recognized that unlike normal memories, traumatic memories are inflexible, invariable. They do not change with time and cannot be evoked at will. Van der Kolk, Fissler, and others analyzed Jeunet's work brilliantly in the mid-1990s. So what's the difference between a flashback and a very, very powerful, strong, overwhelming memory? Aren't they, this, aren't they the same? I just explained, they're not the same. A flashback is when you lose reality testing, where you're unable to tell what is real and what is not. When you believe that your memories are actually reality, when you're back in the battlefield, when you're back in the trauma, in the traumatic, traumatizing situation, back, really, fully, essentially, totally, back. Nothing, if you are back in the battlefield, your bedroom does not exist, your wife does not exist. The supermarket you're in does not exist. You're back in the battlefield, you're fighting for your life, and you're likely to shoot people. So that's not memory. That's definitely not, not emotions <laughs> or the nonsensical emotional flashback. Now, when we recover memories in therapy, which is a very frowned upon experience, uh, uh, practice, by the way, but when we do, and sometimes we do, the majority of recovered memories, not all, but the majority, resemble flashbacks. People with post-traumatic stress disorder report recovered memories as if they are re-experiencing or reliving them, as if this is an instance of re-vividness. Recovered memories are involuntary, they are fragmented, they're accompanied by intense emotions and they are experienced as a reliving of past events. This has been described in numerous studies. Andrews, Malmo, Laidlaw, Van der Hart, Bolt, Van der Kolk, Fisler, you name it. Numerous scholars have, discovered, have described the nature of recovered memories as very flashback-like. But these are recovered memories. These are not spontaneous memories. These are not memories that are in consciousness, but rarely dwelt upon. These are recovered memories, memories that have been repressed so dramatically and so thoroughly that in principle, um, they were inaccessible. And it required therapeutic intervention 
massive radical therapeutic intervention to get to them. And recovered memories are not the unthought known. Bolas's unthought known. This is not the same thing. Okay. So we're beginning to see three categories. We see a category of memories and emotions which are very powerful, could be overwhelming, and so on, and create distress. That's one category. The, this, these are not flashbacks. This is not the same as a flashback. We see a second category of flashbacks, where you experience the past as if it were the present. You're reliving the past. past. You're re-experiencing the past. You, there is re-vividness of the past. And if you're under hypnosis, there is a revivification of the past. That is flashback. And the third category are memories and emotions, which are very powerful, could be overwhelming and dysregulated, but they're inaccessible to consciousness in any way, shape or form. And they have to be provoked or triggered or brought to consciousness. They have to be surfaced by therapeutic intervention. Freud was the first to describe this, and he suggested that he called the emotional or the affective correlate of the memory, he called it a reaction. So these are the three categories at this stage. Compartmentalization and detachment underpin the dissociation of traumatic events. So a traumatic event, a truly traumatic event, I'm not talking about failing an exam, I'm not talking about um, break up with your girlfriend. I'm talking about truly traumatic events. I'm talking about war, I'm talking about accidents. I'm talking about natural disasters. I'm talking about the, the traumatic death of a loved one, your, your child, I'm talking really traumatic events. So when these happen, in order to defend our integrity, in order to protect our cohesion, uh, the cohesion of the self, in order not to fragment and, and break to pieces, disintegrate, to protect and defend against this, against decompensation, what we do is we repress these memories. Sometimes we refrain them, but we always repress them. We bury them deep, deep, and then even deeper. And this creates detachment. We are detached from, from the memories. We have compartmentalized the memories. Now they're in a drawer, which we are never likely to open again. We lock the drawer and throw away the key. And this process is known as dissociation. Sometimes dissociation fails for a variety of reasons. The memories and the emotions could be too, too strong and no amount of dissociation does the trick. Or the dissociation has been implemented wrongly for reasons I will de deal with later. At any rate, sometimes dissociation fails. And when it does fail, we have flashbacks. Now, you know that I'm an adherent of the self-state um, approach to personality. I don't believe there is such a thing as a personality. I don't believe there's such a thing as a unitary self or an ego or whatever you want to call it. I believe that there's an ensemble, there's a theater troupe of self-states and they, that these self-states are reactive to changes in the external and the internal environment. Self-states, the systems of self-states, are organized around memories. That's why memories, without memories, you, you, couldn't, you cannot have a core identity. Without memories, there are no organizing or hermen hermeneutic principles around which you can direct the theater play that is your life using a variety of actors which are the self-states. So you need this narrative, you need this thread, connective, connective tissue between everything and everything, between all the self-states. And so when there is trauma, the trauma and the memories of the trauma, they become the organizing principle. They, the trauma makes sense of your life, of the world, what has happened to you. <clears throat> and so the trauma, be, if the trauma fulfills an exegetic hermeneutic role, explanatory, interpretative role, 
but the trauma also organizes everything. So it's an organizing principle. And the problem is that trauma cues, also known as triggers, can unpredictably, unpredictably reactivate or activate the trauma. And this leads to a sudden intrusion of flashbacks. And flashbacks are usually experienced as incomprehensible intrusions, overlaps, influences, as if some other reality took over. It's a familiar reality, a battle zone, a trauma, traumatic event, and so on. It's something familiar because it's linked to, <laughs> to memories, but it takes over and suspends, even eradicates the real current reality. And this is accompanied by a period of dissociative amnesia. It prompts egodystonic, dangerous and maladaptive behaviors. Self-states, systems of self-states, may be experienced as removing memories, but self-states can also send in memories, dispatch memories. And when the self-state introduces or reintroduces memories into the system, if the memory and the attendant emotions are sufficiently powerful or have been repressed with a lot of investment of energy, these memories are likely to generate flashbacks. And in other situations, they're likely to yield confabulated memories for other states, but we'll not talk not talk about it right now. There is a, a very interesting association between confabulation and flashbacks because confabulation is perceived as real and flashbacks are perceived as real. So there's a linkage there. And the linkage is the memory management by the self-state system. We'll talk about it some other time. Anyhow, even when the person appears to be completely dysregulated. Even then, there's always a self-state that is in control, the controller self-state, the self-state that, that is in charge, self-state that, self that creates or moderates the chaos, the psychological chaos. Someone is in, is in charge. In borderline, the protector state, the psychopathic state, the secondary psychopathic state is the controller state. In DID, dissociative identity disorder, disorders, there's a host uh, so-called personality and the host self-state is in charge. There's always someone in charge. There's no such thing as no one, no one in charge. In narcissism, the false self is in charge. And so this controller entity, this self-state that is in charge, they are the regulators of the traffic of memories. But as I said, sometimes for reasons we are not fully cognizant of or understand, even the controller self-state can get embroiled or involved in triggering flashbacks. We think that maybe it's a defense mechanism. For example, when you find yourself in therapy, your, your controller self-state may generate flashbacks in order to undermine the therapy because the therapy is getting too close for comfort. The insights that the therapy provides threaten to destabilize the whole system. So one of the self-states, usually the controller self-states, generates a flashback in order to dissociate from the therapy and destroy it, destroy the whole process. Self-states appear to experience complex post-traumatic states, flashbacks, and these flashbacks and complex post-traumatic states are divided among the self-states or self-systems in terms of emotional, somatosensory, cognitive and behavioral aspects of memory. There, this, this total experience of a flashback is actually doled out, distributed and allocated between the variety of self-states because the flashback state, the flashback condition, is experienced as reality. And exactly as in reality, the flashback condition has many dimensions. And so these dimensions are distributed among the self-states 
because each self state is specialized. Each self state is better suited, better adapted to cope with specific aspects of reality. Since the flashback is perceived as reality, the entire system of self states is put at the disposal of the flashback, is kidnapped or hijacked by the flashback. And so then you have a self state that is better at planning, a self state that is better at emoting, a self state that is better at analyzing. And so these self states are co opted by the flashback because, again, the individual cannot tell that the flashback is not real, that is only happening in his mind. The individual thinks the flashback is real, it's reality. And there's a mobilization of all the self states to cope with this reality. And some self states appear in frank flashback, others in states similar to the dissociative subtype of PTSD. But that's something for another lecture. I mentioned Pierre Janet. Pierre Janet was the true giant of psychology in the 19th century, and Freud plagiarized a lot from Pierre Janet. Freud plagiarized a lot from everyone, <laughs> but he especially and egregiously plagiarized from Pierre Janet to the point that the normally docile and very pleasant Pierre Janet announced publicly that Freud is a plagiarist, and right he was. Pierre Janet postulated that humans maintain a hierarchy of degrees of reality, and they ascribe these degrees of reality to behaviors, thoughts, imagination, and various perceptions of past, present, and future. In 1928, Pierre Janet created a kind of table of these degrees of hierarchy of reality. He said that trauma survivors may place their traumatic memories too high in the hierarchy, and this results in flashbacks experienced as occurring in the present. In contrast, fantasies would, at the adaptive end of the spectrum, not lead to experience of these mental actions taking over present reality and representing it. So he said that fantasy could be healthy as long as you can tell the difference between fantasy and reality. But in a, in a post-traumatic state, people can't tell the difference between fantasy and reality. Of course, this is the core feature of narcissism, pathological narcissism, which is a post-traumatic state. And so, and when this happens, the traumatic memories and the fantasies, the compensatory fantasies or the defensive fantasies associated with these traumatic memories, they're placed too high in the hierarchy of realities, and then they're mistaken for reality. And then we call it flashback. There's been a recent meta-analysis, and it demonstrated a robust link between dissociation and hallucinations distinct from flashbacks. That's a study by Longden and others in 2020. And so Longden, L-O Long, then, and so we're beginning, we're entering the second phase of our conversation. We have established this as a connection between dissociation and flashbacks and flashbacks and uh, post-traumatic uh, reactions or syndromes. That's well established. What about psychosis? What about psychosis? And the most salient and typical feature of psychosis, the most relevant feature of psychosis, which is hallucinations. Can't, can't we say safely that a flashback is some form of hallucination. And if we agree that a flashback is a hallucination, can't we then continue inexorably to the next conclusion that a, that flash, a flashback is a micro-psychotic state? It's a kind of temporary psychosis. London says that we cannot. There's a robust link between dissociation and hallucinations. That part is true but they're not the same as flashbacks. To understand why, I recommend that you read the study by London. Anyhow, flashbacks are the hallmark of post-traumatic stress disorder. They can be understood as dissociative intrusions of sensory perceptual aspects of a previous trauma, intrusions on the present. 
the individual may be unaware of the link between these experiences of flashback, of these experiences of intrusion and past events. Nadel and Jacobs demonstrated it in 1996. It is a common myth and common mistake, even among clinicians and scholars, to say that when the individual experiences flashbacks, he identifies, he's able to identify the traumatic events that gave rise to the flashback. That is expressly untrue. There are cases where individuals are at a loss. They cannot explain the content of the flashback. They are transported back to environments and situations in periods which are utterly unfamiliar to them, alien. And this is very disconcerting and very terrifying. And this is called decontextualization. And decontextualization relates to traumatic memories, like in the study of Nadel and Jacobs, but it also pertains to schizophrenia. Daniel Rizzo Bruant in 1999, demonstrated decontextualization in schizophrenia. When the sufferer, the patient of the schizophrenic patient, experiences a reality, is convinced that it is reality, and yet is unable to trace this reality to anything that preceded it, it has no antecedents, is unable to link the emergent spontaneous reality to anything that came before it, to any event, to any trauma, to any experience, to any period, to any environment, to any group of people. It comes out of nowhere, a total bubble. And so we see the decontextualization exists in both flashbacks and in schizophrenia, which is essentially a psychotic disorder. We're exploring now the connection between flashbacks and psychosis, to remind you. And so such delusions, because decontextualization is a delusion, is a delusion because the experienced reality or hyper, hyper reality in the flashback and the experienced reality or hyper reality in schizophrenia, these experiences are divorced from anything that preceded them, divorced from any other dimension or aspect or figment or ingredient or component of reality. So it's a delusion in effect. And so we can understand these delusions as deriving from sensory and emotional flashbacks that are so dissociated from their spatial temporal context as to be unrecognizable as memories. In other words, what causes us, what causes the patients to uh, fail to connect the experience of the flashback or the experience of the psychosis to the past is the intensity of the dissociation and the repression. When the dissociation is super intense and the repression is total and like, wow, unbelievable investment, cathexis, unbelievable investment, in forgetting the memory, eradicating the memory, obliterating the memory, burying it, trampling on it, destroying it, this, you know, just never again. When this kind of investment happens, when the memory resurfaces in the form of a flashback or a psychotic episode, it is perceived as real, but not as connected to anything. It's perceived as real, but disconnected real but not a part of the previous reality because indeed the dissociation has severed all connection to episodic memory and autobiographical memory and i refer you to work by hardy moskowitz nadel watts jacobs and many others the re-emergence of implicit memories of early disorganized attachment experiences which cannot be recalled as autobiographical memories, may provide the foundation for a wide range of delusions, including paranoia and grandiosity. And I refer you to studies by Liotti, Gamli, Moskowitz, Monteroso, and others. 
we're beginning to see that when the dissociation and the repression are super intense, in other words, when the trauma has been unusually, unusually egregious, then this gives rise to disorganized attachment on the one hand, and the experience of attachment is also scatterbrained and totally diffuse, and a disruption in the formation of autobiographical memories, and later on identity. So we have identity disturbance, and we have uh, a wide range of cognitive impairments and cognitive distortions, reality, impairment, reality testing impairment, and these are compensatory. These delusions of paranoia, grandiosity, these delusions are compensatory because they are no real, they are no accessible memories. They've been repressed and buried and dissociated. There is an attempt to compensate for this dissociative gap, for this memory gap. In other words, what emerges is very interesting. It says that delusions and cognitive distortions, such as paranoia, such as grandiosity, are actually confabulations. I remind you, confabulation is a feature of psychotic disorders, and especially schizophrenia. Narcissists confabulate as well, which is a very powerful indication that underlying pathological narcissism, there's essentially a psychotic disorder with hyperreflexivity, uh, which is something that Otto Kernberg has alluded to many times, and that's why the, the word that's where the word borderline comes from. The border, the border between psychosis and neurosis. Traumatic flashbacks, either directly in the form of sensory flashbacks, which are mistaken for hallucinations, or as interpretations of flashbacks, delusions, um, particularly when the delusions are strongly emotional. So, traumatic flashbacks come in two forms, direct sensory experiences, which resemble very much hallucinations, and emotional, de emotionally tinted delusions about oneself, about the world, about relationships between oneself and the world, and so on. And delusions, of course, are compensatory, whereas the direct sensory experience the direct sensory uh, hallucination, in a way, and which is a feature of flashbacks, is actually a disruption or a failure of the dissociative mechanism. The delusions are compensatory. It's like, I don't have a self, it's disrupted, it's diffused. I don't have an identity, it's disturbed. I don't have continuous memories because I'm dissociative. I'm falling apart, I'm disjointed, I'm fragmented, and so on and so forth. But I am godlike, or I am the center of malign, uh, malevolent intent by others. That's conspiracy theories and the paranoid ideation. So these, the grandiosity, the paranoia, and other types of delusions, they make sense. They are the glue that creates an as-if identity as if identity, pseudo identity. There's now, with your grandiosity, you can make sense of your self. You can have a false self. Now, with your grandiosity, you can experience an identity. And what is your identity? Your identity is the target of malign intent. Your identity is the focus of, of a conspiracy. That's your, so these are compensatory mechanisms. In the study, uh, there, and, and there are various, uh, various studies that uh, demonstrate this um, and link, link all this traumatic baggage or traumatic instrumentation, post-traumatic instrumentation, if you wish, link it to attachment problems in early childhood and the development of disorganized attachment mainly. And I'm referring you to work by Moskowitz, Monterosso, and others. In a study of adult survivors of childhood abuse, 
negative and positive dissociative symptoms were correlated actually with complex trauma. Now, when I say when when I say negative symptoms, these are depersonalization, derealization, and to some extent amnesia. Positive symptoms are flashbacks, not because they are positive, not because they are nice, <laughs> but because they are active. So we have passive symptoms which are negative. We have active symptoms. A flashback is an active symptom. Anyhow, these dissociative symptoms, positive and negative, were correlated actually in adult survivors of childhood abuse. They were correlated with complex trauma and with disturbances in self-organization. But they were also correlated with symptoms of PTSD and symptoms of borderline personality disorder. And I'll come to it in the second part of the lecture. In the meantime, I refer you to studies by Kneffel, Tran, Löger, Schuster, and others. Back to flashbacks. Flashbacks are obviously an unambiguously direct consequence of abuse trauma. And it's unrelated to psychological development. Flashbacks are not the outcome of some disruption in psychological development. There are other psychopathological manifestations of such disruption. When the formation of the self is disrupted, formation of the ego is disrupted, we have very bad consequences later down the road. For example, pathological narcissism. But flashbacks have to do with the trauma, and especially the trauma of abuse, so flashbacks are associated with complex trauma, not only with PTSD, which is a new emerging understanding. 2016, 2019, these are the studies that began to establish a connection between flashbacks and complex trauma. Because until more or less 2011, we believed that flashbacks are unique to post-traumatic stress disorder the classic var uh, variant, not to complex trauma. Today we know better. Complex trauma can and does induce flashbacks. These are failures. Flashbacks are failures of defensive exclusion, excluding the trauma content, excluding the memory of the trauma, excluding the emotions that were attendant upon the trauma. This prevented re-vividness. Um, this was a defensive mechanism, a defensive array. When, this, when these defenses crumble, when they fail, there's a subsequent surfacing of flesh bulb memories of significant failures in emotional exchanges. It could be emotional exchanges with the attachment figure, like a primary caregiver, a mother, a father later, later on in life. It could be failure in exchanges with other significant figures in one's life, role models, teachers, peers, and so on. But the, there is a close connection between complex trauma, attachment failure, uh, failures in emotional exchanges with important figures, significant figures in life, and ultimately failures of defenses against trauma, which lead to intrusions such as flashbacks, which leads me to borderline personality disorder. People diagnosed with borderline personality disorder with dissociative symptoms, it's about one third of all borderlines, experience strong flashbacks, trance, angry dissociative ego state, ego states and memory problems. But ironically, these people, borderline, dissociative borderlines, uh, experience little frank amnesia, just run-of-the-mill amnesia. Now, borderlines with highly dissociative symptoms, which amount to DDNOS, and you can watch the video I've made about the connection between borderline personality disorder and OSDD, which is a form of dissociative identity disorder. So borderlines which have um, an attenuated form of dissociative identity disorder, that's about one-seventh, one-eighth to one-seventh of all borderlines, experienced strong flashbacks, 
coming to from amnesia, internal voices, and child and persecutor dissociated ego states. Severe dissociative symptoms and flashbacks may find expression in the form of acute reactive dissociative psychosis. So this is where psychosis, dissociative identity disorder, and borderline personality disorder come together in flashbacks. The differential diagnostic criterion, which gives rise to the differential diagnosis, should be flashbacks. The flashbacks, the existence of flashbacks in the borderline personality pathology. The flashbacks are strongly indicative of dissociative symptoms and dissociative identity disorder in more extreme cases. Now, even when we discuss PTSD, classic PTSD, even then, Criterion B symptoms of PTSD may resemble psychosis, with nightmares, flashbacks, and intrusive thoughts mimicking many characteristics of the Schneiderian first-rank psychotic symptoms, which are more common among dissociative patients than psychotic clients. I refer you to the early work by Ross in 1990. I'm mentioning this because there's an attempt to reconceptualize or recharacterize borderline personality disorder as a mere variant of, of complex trauma of CPTSD with maybe some extreme form of emotional dysregulation. Indeed, there is this diagnosis of emotionally unstable personality disorder, which has replaced borderline personality disorder. But I think it's a mistaken direction because it does not take into account the very important foundation of borderline personality disorder, which is dissociation. Borderline personality disorder is a post-traumatic condition, exactly like pathological narcissism. In both cases, there's probably a genetic predisposition to react by developing a personality disorder. But heredity is the template. The content of the template is abuse and trauma. Abuse and trauma trigger these children to become later on in life borderlines and narcissists. So these are post-traumatic conditions. And to reduce the post-traumatic condition merely to emotional dysregulation, ignoring psychotic elements, ignoring dissociation or dissociative states, or even dissociative identity disorder, ignoring uh, flashbacks. And this is ignoring practice. This is ignoring what every clinician who has ever worked with borderline personality disorder can tell you. It's wrong to reduce borderline to emotional dysregulation. It's wrong, simply wrong. There's so much, there's so much more to borderline personality disorder. And so flashbacks actually occur in about one half of patients with borderline personality disorder. Very similar to PTSD. Inappropriate intense anger could be a hyperactivated emotional part experiencing flashbacks of past mistreatment, for example. That is, if we apply the um, structural dissociation model to borderline personality disorder. In an analysis of 34 borderline participants conducted by Kozekva and Dell, Dell is the god of dissociative, uh, dissociative disorders. So Kozekva and Dell in 2010 analyzed 34 patients with borderline personality disorder. 50% or more reported dissociative symptoms that are typical of a severe dissociative disorder. They endorsed at a clinicus, clinically significant level trance-like states, hearing voices, depersonalization, amnesia for recent and remote events, large memory gaps, and doing or saying things when angry that they did not remember. Their flashbacks lasted for days 
involved loss of contact with the present and made them want to inflict pain on themselves or even die. Importantly, they rated depersonalization as only sometimes stress-related. It actually occurred about three times per month and lasted most of the day for no reason at all. And so I've discussed borderline at length in other videos. There's a borderline personality disorder playlist on this channel, and I don't want to stray too far from the topic of today's video. But flashbacks should be the litmus test and the main diagnostic criterion of dissociative or disorders of dissociative states, dissociative disorders, PTSD, CPTSD, and borderline personality disorder. The dissociative core of dissociative identity disorder. In other words, the dissociative symptoms always present regardless of the level of dissociation. This core reflects the activities of self-state or alter, alter identities, experiences of identity confusion and memory problems. The dissociative core of borderlines emphasizes flashbacks, experiences of identity confusion and memory problems. So there's a bit of a difference between the two. Regression analysis of flashback scores uh, demonstrated that 61% of the variance in borderline personality disorders flashback scores is unexplained. And so it seems that flashbacks in borderline personality disorder are probably more structural. They're more built in. Um, to quote Ladis, they are more a consequence of their characterological and neurobiological reactivity. Uh, so in PTSD, the flashbacks are a consequence of the trauma or an artifact, if you're so inclined, of the trauma. The trauma produces the flashbacks. In borderline personality disorder, the flashbacks are autonomous processes either because of the genetics of borderline personality disorder, the brain abnormalities, no one knows. But flashbacks are built into the borderline personality disorder structure and organization. They're an integral, they're not a bug, they're a feature. They're an integral part of it. Intrusive dissociative phenomena um, include the experience of traumatic flashbacks. Pieces of dissociated memory, emotion or perception suddenly intrude upon awareness. We could say that flashbacks are involuntary and intrusive, distressing memories via re-experiencing. These are dissociative reactions. There's a loss of grounding, a loss of reality testing. And when, the, when criterion B in the DSM-5, criterion B, of PTSD equates flashbacks with dissociative reactions, involuntary, intrusive nature of a dissociative um, art, uh, kind of process, impact on the regulation of consciousness. It's all true, but it assumes, the DSM assumes that all these features, involuntary nature, intrusive nature, impact on regulation of consciousness, altered state of consciousness, the DSM assumes that all these are pathological features of a pathological process while the pathological process is at work. The etiology is totally pathologized, totally traced to an or psychopathology. But that is that doesn't seem to be the case. Many clinicians of trauma therapists, so on, who work with trauma patients, would tell you that even when the PTSD is cured or when there is a total recovery from PTSD, the flashbacks continue. Flashbacks seem to be divorced from the underlying psychopathological process of PTSD, CPTSD, BPD, or whatever. They are autonomous manifestations of internal cerebral 
or neurocerebral or neurobiological organization. It's exactly like dreaming. I can compare flashbacks to dreaming. When you're in a dream, you think you're in reality. And dreaming and flashbacks probably fulfill the same function. I could even say that flashbacks are dreaming in a wake, wakeful state. They fulfill the same function. Reorganizing memories. Realigning them. Making them conform to a core identity or in the absence of a core identity. Generating a confabulated narrative, delusional narrative of a core identity. For example, in narcissism. So, flashbacks are autonomous functions of the brain as it attempts to make sense of reality by organizing memories in a way which would yield a coherent and cohesive narrative, also known as identity. We have tactile, sensory motoric post traumatic flashbacks. We have olfactory triggered flashbacks. Anything can trigger a flashback, and many times nothing triggers the flashback that we know of. Um, and that's why often we tend to confuse or misdiagnose flashbacks as hallucinations because flashback experiences give the impression of hallucinations. They give the impression of psychosis. But it's not true. It's very important to differentiate between the two. Flashbacks are functional. They fulfill a function. Hallucinations don't. In the, in the theory of structural dissociation, in some cases of PTSD and the dissociative PTSD, PTSDD, there's a contrast between maintaining some functionality in some areas of life while coping in a depersonalized, derealized manner by experiencing amnesia, this is the ANP, versus episodes in flashback, uh, episodes of flashback in PTSD, or extreme emotional overregulation in PTSDD, which is the EP part of structural dissociation. The flashback of memories from disparate events indicated impaired binding during the encoding of abuse experiences as well as gist based distortion. So the flashback, the flashback reflects a failure in binding memories, a failure in shelving them, a failure in organizing them appropriately, classifying them, cataloging them, a failure in, in nosology, if you wish, on the one hand. And on the other hand, it has its own inherent, innate content, the gist of the re-experience, the gist of the re-vividness, the gist of the hyper-reality imposed upon real reality. And so sometimes this leads to suicidality. This phenomenon is known as flashback suicidality. And flashback suicidality is a re-experiencing of suicidal ideation that had occurred, had happened in the period recreated in the flashback. So, flashback suicidality is derivative, is second-hand. In the flashback, you experience the environment, physical environment, you experience the circumstances, the history, the episodic memory, you experience, um, you experience the uh, people who were involved at the time, you experience the interactions, especially traumatic interactions, and you also, of course, experience the emotions that you have felt at the time. And typically, the emotions that you have felt at the time included suicidal ideation. And so it's re-evoked, re provoked by, within the flashback. It's a form of emotional reliving or emotional re-experiencing. But the body is also deeply and heavily involved in the flashback. 
because the body keeps the score. The body is the repository of trauma memories. Body memories, flashbacks or reenactments of the physical discomforts seemingly associated with traumatic experiences. Body memories are very common. If somebody wakes up with a pain and stiffness in the neck and shoulders, psychiatrically, we would try to figure out, say, whether this is a tactile flashback. I'm quoting now from the book. Or have, of having struggled against being pinned down and strangled or raped 30 years ago. Or on the other hand, whether while visiting mother last night, she said something grossly unempathic and demeaning and the immediate reaction was the impulse to strangle her. So when we have a flashback of being pinned down, it's because we have been pinned down or because we should have been pinned down. We had an impulse that had to be controlled. And the flashback reflects this internal reality, the memory, the suppression of the impulse and so on. I'm going to read this section again. This is very important. If somebody wakes up in pain and stiffness in the neck and shoulders, psychiatric psychiatrically, one wants to figure out, say, whether this, this is a tactile flashback of having struggled against being pinned down and strangled or raped 30 years ago. Or on the other hand, whether while visiting mother last night, she said something grossly unempathic and demeaning, and the immediate reaction was the impulse to strangle her. And so one of the scholars says, I'm quoting, in practice, I accept the classic Freudian concept of repression, not only as the repression of a wish that gains somatic expression in a compromised formation, conversion proper, but also as the expression of a trauma in a given host to alter in the case of dissociative identity disorder. And this repression of trauma gains somatic expression in a partial post-traumatic flashback, body memory. It is worth noting that this second sort of conversion was Freud's initial idea, which he then largely replaced by the first sort. Historically, trauma preceded wish, and then wish replaced trauma. And now we have the return of the repressed. Trauma trumps wish, but both survive. More commonly, children show dissociative manifestations without evidence of discrete identity fragmentation. Terr, T-E-R-R, -R, in 1988, described trance-like states in traumatized children during which they rigidly and compulsively reenact traumatic scenarios. During dissociative episodes, the child may have a look of non-recognition in response to usually familiar people or places. Sometimes during these dissociative states, the children will appear to have a flashback in which they reenact traumatic scenarios with shouts of no and body movements simulating a violent assault. The work, there's a lot of work on this by Sintron, Salum, Blair, Andrews and Storch. I read to you this segment to demonstrate that the entire armament the entire array of dissociative tools and instruments and weapons is available early in childhood. Everything has a precedent in childhood, including flashbacks, including flashbacks, all dissociative states, dissociation, repression. The child comes fully equipped with these tools and it is the abuse and trauma of the child that trigger these tools and they become entrenched and later on in life, they become habitual. A child who has had flashbacks as a child would grow up to be an adult who, who has flashbacks on a regular basis. A child who has had to dissociate horrific experiences of abuse and trauma is unlikely to become a well-composed, well-balanced adult. The dissociation will continue to work furiously in order to prevent contact with a shameful, harrowing experiences. And when and if it fails, the person experiences internal mortification, dissociates the dissociation, and tries to defend against the intolerable new condition 
either by developing delusions or in extreme cases psychosis or by experiencing a flashback a flashback may be just an attempt to reenact early childhood trauma abuse and conflict in order to try to resolve them differently and it doesn't have to be early childhood or trauma if you are an army vet in vietnam you've experienced trauma and you're likely to experience flashbacks flashbacks may be attempts to revisit such scenes periods and environments and circumstances in order to try to resolve them differently in other words flashbacks may be a form of self-administered re-traumatization self-administered therapy but of course the individual is helpless to make any good therapeutic use of flashbacks because flashbacks do not provide a different narrative or resolution they are dumb in the sense that they just reenact it's like watching a movie and so it gets the individual nowhere and the dis dissociation continues even more furiously than before because now the individual develops anxiety is afraid of the oncoming flashbacks that's why flashbacks are a major issue in therapy especially trauma therapy and they require intervention which is much more subtle than we are providing nowadays we need to realize the multiple layers of flashbacks and how they interact with a variety of other protective mechanisms such as dissociation such as borderline personality organization such as emotional dysregulation which is also in many ways a protective mechanism such as protector or controller self-states such as pathological narcissism such as delusions of grandiosity and paranoia such as the false self in borderline and narcissism these are all protective mechanisms and flashbacks are just one of them and treating flashbacks in isolation or treating flashbacks as nothing more than the re-emergence of suppressed memories and it's going to go away this is wrong disastrously and catastrophically wrong many times remember as a traumatized and abused child or traumatized and abused adult suicide is never far from consciousness suicidal ideation is a normal reaction to such unusual conditions outliers and if you treat these conditions as normal if you trivialize trivialize this the trauma and abuse if you invalidate the patient suicidal ideation is likely to recur even within the flashback it's a risk no therapist should take 